So fasting is burning you out. All right, you're doing a lot of fasting and you found that you're just not getting results anymore. In fact, you find that you're actually getting more fatigued when you fast and, and you're starting to wonder if it's something for you. Okay, well it could be something known as adrenal fatigue that's related with a fast, but, and this is a very big but, a little bit of adrenal wear is normal for a fast. We just have to know how to balance it. We're going to have surges of cortisol that occur during a fast. We just have to learn how to manipulate them and know how they work within our body. Cortisol is just as good as it is bad. So we're gonna make some solid sense of all of this when we explain how fasting affects your adrenals and the protocol that you can follow to lessen the impact. So we have new videos almost every single day nowadays. Okay, like seven days a week coming out at 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. So please make sure you're keeping it locked in here on the channel. Make sure you hit that red subscribe button and then please go ahead and hit that bell icon so you can turn on notifications and know whenever I post a new video. You don't wanna be missing out. All right, so like my good friend Mike Mutzel put it, he said, fearing that fasting is going to harm your adrenals is similar to fearing that exercise is bad because it raises your blood pressure, okay? Fasting is supposed to put a little bit of stress on your adrenals. It's supposed to raise cortisol, okay? Just like exercise is supposed to raise your blood pressure, okay? We just have to make sure that we're paying attention. If you exercise to the point where your blood pressure is bursting your arteries, it's obviously not good. So if you're fasting, doing the wrong things to the point where you're burning out your adrenals, then yeah, it's a bad thing. And it can lead to belly fat accumulation and it can lead to those stall outs. So let's talk about how this works first of all and reference some studies and then let's give you the goods that you can use to make sure this doesn't happen to you. So this first study was published in the Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism and it took a look at fasting and it found that fasting does indeed increase your cortisol levels, but it does so in a different fashion from what we think. You see, it increases the pulse of cortisol pulses. It doesn't increase the overall duration or the amount of cortisol spread out. You see, the way that our body produces cortisol is in these surges. It's not like our body just leaks out cortisol throughout the course of the day. Our body surges cortisol at different pulses. So what this study did is it took a look at eight men and it had them go ahead and do a control day where they ate as normal and then measured their cortisol levels. And then it had them do a five day fast and measured their cortisol levels at the end of the five day fast or on the fifth day. So what they found was interesting. They found that there was a 1.8 X increase in cortisol levels on the fasting days than the non-fasting days, but 1.6 X increase just in the pulses. So what that ultimately means is that fasting just increased the sizes of the pulses of cortisol. Now what's interesting about this is that if we could actually determine when our body was pulsing cortisol, we could really manipulate our fast. Like we could determine, hey, our cortisol levels are really high right now, so let's get a workout so we burn more fat. Or our cortisol levels are really low right now, so let's break our fast so we have less impact. More on that to come later in other videos after I dive into more research. But the cool thing is we know that cortisol just releases over a trickle of time. Okay, this next study was published in the journal Cell. And this study found that short-term fasts do not increase cortisol a whole lot. So this study took a look at time-restricted eating. Okay, took a look at a group that was eating over a six hour period of time, so a six hour eating window, and a group that had a 12 hour eating window. So basically a fasting group and a non-fasting group in an intermittent fasting style. And they found that there was no real increase in cortisol in the six hour eating group compared to the 12 hour eating group, and no real change in the morning surge of cortisol. So actually with shorter term intermittent fasting, you probably don't have a huge spike in cortisol unless you're doing it frequently, which a lot of you probably are if you practice intermittent fasting. So you do need to understand how cortisol works. So let's talk about cortisol for a minute and how it relates with belly fat and fat accumulation, but also fat burning. So cortisol is released under any kind of physiological or even psychological stress, right? So the brain signals the release of specific adrenocorticotropin hormones that therefore end up releasing glucocorticoids. All that means is that your brain sends a signal to the adrenals to release certain things, one of which is cortisol. Okay, this can be bad, but it can also be really good. You see, cortisol is highly fat burning. It burns a lot of fat, but cortisol also can make you store fat. Well, where's the difference? Cortisol is helpful when there's no other food in the equation because cortisol turns on hormone sensitive lipase. So cortisol, when we're during a, like doing a fast, that helps us. That actually helps us having these surges of cortisol because it triggers fat to be burned. But if it goes chronic for too long, then it can throw off the whole axis, it can make it so your adrenals burn out and you feel fatigued. Cortisol, when combined with food, is when things are bad. When cortisol combines with insulin, which is released when we eat, 
that's when you end up having body fat accumulate. Okay, and it all has to do with the fact that we have glucocorticoid receptors in our abdomen. So those glucocorticoids that are released by the adrenals and that whole process, we have glucocorticoid receptors in our abdomen, in our belly fat. So if we have food coming in and we have cortisol levels high, then we run into the issue where the fat gets stored specifically in that area where we have those receptors. That's why those old commercials that talk about cortisol and belly fat, that's where they got that whole thing. Okay, it all comes down to that. So with that, we have to take a look at a protocol. I want you to be able to fast without having big, giant surges in cortisol that burn out your adrenals. I don't want your body to get so used to fasting that cortisol levels just stay high all the time so your body never gets really an opportunity to take advantage of the surges of cortisol. Cortisol is our friend when we can control the surges. It's not our friend when it's chronically high. Then our body just doesn't respond to it in a good way anymore. We want these spikes of cortisol to elicit a fat burning response. So what do you do? Okay, step one, if you're going to increase the length of your fast, do so in a small increment. Okay, slowly increase how long you fast. Start with a 12 hour fast, then go to a 13, then go to a 14, 15, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, slowly tack it on. What that's gonna do is it's gonna make it so your body adapts so you're not having this chronic heavy stress load by saying, I'm gonna do a five day fast, then I'm gonna do another five day fast. You just don't wanna do that. That's a lot of stress on your body. We want the stress on our body, but again, not so much that damages our adrenals. Then the next thing we wanna look at is proper use of electrolytes. Okay, this is a simple one. Okay, the Journal of Endocrinology published a study that did find that when people fasted without electrolytes, their cortisol levels and their adrenaline levels would go really, really high. So that's probably to say that if electrolytes were in the mix, we could at least balance it and take the stress off the adrenals a little bit more. Okay, if we're deficient in salt, the adrenals end up causing all kinds of issues. Okay, we have this release of aldosterone, which causes the subsequent release of cortisol. So keeping our minerals in place, like our sodium, ends up making it so that we don't have as high of a spike of cortisol or constant, basically constant elevation of cortisol. So it makes life a lot better for those that are fasting. Now, what we really have to pay attention to is how we go about breaking our fast and how we go about the tail end of our fast. So this is probably the most important part of this video because it's what's giving you the concrete steps, okay? So what we have to pay attention to, when cortisol is combined with insulin, we store fat. Okay, let me say that again. When cortisol is combined with insulin, we store fat. So if our cortisol levels are high because we're fasting, it makes it so that when we do eat, we're much more likely to store what we eat. Okay, cortisol levels are already high, and then we eat something, so insulin levels are high, in conjunction with cortisol. So we need to bring cortisol down before we break our fast. And you can do that by relaxing and doing whatever you can, but there's also some dietary things that you can do. Okay, switching over to tea instead of coffee in the afternoon is probably one of the most pivotal things you can do. Coffee is fine, I'm not anti-coffee. Coffee in the morning when you already have a surge of cortisol going is really good, okay? But in the afternoon, the last thing you wanna do is spike your cortisol even higher before you break your fast and you add food and insulin into the mix. So switch away from the caffeine over to like a tea or even an herbal tea and your cortisol levels will come down so that when you do break your fast, you have less of an impact on your body. Now, Another thing you can do is cinnamon. Okay, so if you wanna combine these things, you can use like peak tea has these things. Okay, so these are, you've seen me talk about these guys before. I've talked about the green tea ones, but now they have ones that actually have cinnamon in them as well. So they're more of an herbal tea. So this is something that you can drink prior to breaking your fast. That's gonna make it so that not only your cortisol levels can come down, but cinnamon has a really unique effect. So what cinnamon does is it acts upon the cell. Okay, and it acts upon the cell much like insulin, but without insulin. So it tells the cell to open up like insulin does, but with no insulin. So therefore, even if cortisol levels are a little bit higher, we're getting an insulin-like effect without the actual insulin. So we're able to open the cell without spiking our insulin. Whenever we eat, we spike our insulin. But if we can spike our insulin without actually spiking insulin, we can make it so that cortisol doesn't have the damaging effects. So tea is awesome, but since peak tea actually has these different variations of fasting teas, that's literally what they are, are fasting teas. And if you know Dr. Jason Fung, he's really well known and world renowned in the world of fasting, long-term fasting and intermittent fasting. He's the one that designed these things. So you can check them out. There's a link down in the description if you do wanna get your hands on some of these, these specific flavors, as well as other ones that he's got for different periods of time during your fast. So make sure you check them out, special discount down below in the description. Okay, so how this all works, additionally, when you break your fast, 
you don't want to be having carbohydrates. Whether you are following a low-carb diet or not, do not have carbohydrates. So there's a study that was published in the Journal of Physiology and Behavior that found that subjects that consumed higher carbohydrate meals had a higher cortisol spike than those that consumed fat or protein. So I recommend breaking your fast, no matter what you're doing, with just lean protein. Simple protein. That's not going to cause a big spike in insulin, okay? Remember, the goal after we break a fast is to control our insulin, to not have a big insulin spike. So that way, our cortisol levels are still up here because we've been fasting. We're not bringing our insulin levels way up here. Otherwise, we would store everything that we ate after we broke a fast. We don't want that. So we want to use our cinnamon tea or whatever we can to bring insulin levels nice and low, to control blood sugar, but also to bring cortisol a little bit lower, and then break our fast. Okay? It makes life much, much better. So the protocol is pretty simple. Do what you can to keep your cortisol levels lower towards the last third of your fast. Do everything you can. Meditate. Take a nap. Go for a simple walk. If you work out towards the end of the fast, your cortisol levels are going to be higher, which means that you're going to have to take drastic measures, probably get some more cinnamon in, get some other things that are going to reduce cortisol, and try to really relax before you actually break your fast. And try to wait 30 or 60 minutes after your workout before you break your fast, if that's the case. Okay? So remember, utilize whatever you can to get those cortisol levels down towards the end of your fast. In the beginning, you want the cortisol because it's going to help you burn fat. And remember, you can take advantage of Peak Tea down below in the description if you want to get a special price on them. So as always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you in the next video.